begin this evening by singing. You'll find it in these blue hymn books at number 570, a great hymn that speaks about the city of God, the kingdom of God, and all that he is doing for this earth. Glorious things of you are spoken, Zion, city of our God. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Solid joys and lasting treasures, none but Zion's children know. And Lord, we gather this evening as a people who confess that surely this must be true because you've opened our eyes to the great treasure, the pearl of great price. 
the glory of the gospel of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ wherein he has opened to us the city of God flung open the gates of righteousness the way in to the place where he himself dwells so that as the psalmist spoke of the Jerusalem of old God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved God will help her when the morning's dawn the nations may rage the kingdoms totter but when he the God of Zion utters his voice the earth melts and it is this God the God of hosts who is with us the God of Jacob and we thank you Lord that in our Lord Jesus Christ you have opened the gate of Zion to this whole world no longer causing that world to come to a physical Jerusalem to a temple and to a king enthroned there to find you to find the heart of the universe the meaning of this world but sending out in these latter days from Zion from Jerusalem there first through your apostles and all those who had come to know the risen Lord Jesus Christ sending into all the world this gospel of peace to proclaim a way out of darkness and out of bondage and out of the slavery to death itself that is the lot of every human being ever born on this planet but to find at last the gates to life life in its fullness life in abundance life that is as you purposed it to be for human beings without end lived forever always in your presence full of joy and this life is the life that you have given one in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and to be shared on the great day of his coming with all who are his so that every one of us here this evening who believes and trusts in him who knows Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit poured out in our hearts can know that the same Spirit who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead will also raise our bodies likewise to live and to reign with him in glory and so Lord this is our great hope in which we're saved as sure as real indeed more real than all that we can see for as your word tells us all that we can see will still pass away but what is unseen to human eye but clear bright beautiful to the eye of faith is this everlasting truth of your gospel promise to us and so, Lord, we as Christian people should be the most joyous people in all this earth, filled as we are in our hearts with the knowledge of a great and glorious future. And, Lord, we pray that that will be more and more what fills our minds and hearts so that as we walk in a world that is dark, that is still under the curse, full of sinfulness, deeply fallen, and as we struggle day by day with our own bodies and minds which likewise are still so flawed, so faulted, full of sin that we should never lose our hope and that what is real and substantial and eternal would grasp us, gripping our hearts and enabling us to fight the fight of faith all the days of our lives and to the very end naming our Lord Jesus Christ as the way and the truth and the life and as the one who leads us and guides us even as he guards us through life for that inheritance to be revealed in the last day so Lord we gather this evening knowing our weakness knowing our frailty knowing our need for constant forgiveness and for constant strengthening we come seeking that forgiveness confident in your grace and your mercy that promises to us to all who are truly penitent the forgiveness that washes away all that we would have done wrong 
and all that would stand between us. And your spirit to strengthen our feeble knees and to steal us and strengthen us as we walk with you. So come to us, Lord, we ask. Fill our hearts with praise. Fill our spirits with deep hope as you teach us the way of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A warm welcome to all, as I've said. Uh, if you were here this morning, you'll have picked up one of these notice sheets. If not, they're, uh, if they're not on your seats, then they're outside on the, uh, the tables outside. Do pick one up. They tell you everything that you need for uh, uh, knowing what's going on in the life of the church this week. There are also some advance notices there. And uh, rather than go through them all, I'll just trust you to pick one up yourself uh, to read them and to avail yourself of them. Just one thing to emphasize, and that is Wednesday evening this week, um, our small groups are meeting all centrally in, in the building here. People coming together uh, for coffee and so on to begin with, then breaking into groups. We're studying together uh, a series on Christian doctrine. So do come along. If you've not been part of one of those, we really do want to encourage you to come and join in. So you can just pitch up on Wednesday, 7 for 7.30, and we'll be glad to, uh, to fit you into a, a, one of those groups. Um, Thursday evenings, there's uh, events going on for students and young workers, and uh, Andy Ritson's going to come and tell us about that. As he comes up, just let me tell all of you who are interested that uh, we have a new addition to the fellowship this morning in the form of young Noah Brennan, born to uh, the Brennan family, and uh, all is well. I, can't, I can tell you he's a boy and he's called Noah. I can't tell you how much he weighs or any of those things. You'll have to ask the women for that. But anyway, you've got the general idea, so we're all rejoicing. Where are you, Andy? You're here. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, particularly speaking to students, um, we just wanted to make you aware that straight after this service, um, we're planning on meeting down in the Campsy Room, um, which you'll pass on the way up um, into the hall. And we're planning on having a supper there for all students and young workers who might be new to the church and also anyone who's currently a student or a young worker. So it's a good chance just to mingle and during that time, I'll be giving you an update on what's happening for the students uh, and young workers coming up in this coming week, uh, particularly letting you know about Release the Word, which is our Bible study program, which starts this Thursday at quarter to seven. So please don't be a stranger. Please do come down. There's nice, hot, savory croissants available. Um, so it's a win-win for everyone. Okay. You'll have to prove you look young enough if you want a croissant, I've been told. So anyway, do your best. We're going to sing again, and uh, it's on the screens, I think, a version of Psalm 62 that reminds us, although our hope is very real in what is unseen, sometimes it feels very hard, but we wait for the Lord from whom our salvation comes.
Well, we turn now to our Bible reading, which you'll find in the book of Numbers. And the book of Numbers begins, and that's where we're beginning tonight, Numbers chapter 1, on page 108 in our hardback Bibles, if you have one, page 108, Numbers chapter 1. Now, we'll be looking at chapters 1 and 2 this evening. It would be too much to read all of that out this evening, so I'll read parts of it and then summarize the other parts as we go along. So Numbers chapter 1 and verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel, by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male, head by head. From 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war, you and Aaron shall list them, company by company. And there shall be with you a man from each tribe, each man being the head of the house of his fathers. And these are the names of the men who shall assist you. From Reuben, Elizur, the son of Shedeur. From Simeon, Shelumiel, the son of Zurishaddai. From Judah, Nashon, the son of Aminadab. From Issachar, Nethanel, the son of Zuar. From Zebulun, Eliab, the son of Helon. From the sons of Joseph. From Ephraim, Elishamah, the son of Amihud. And from Manasseh, Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur. From Benjamin, Abidan, the son of Gideoni. From Dan, Ahiezer, the son of Amishaddai. From Asher, Pagiel, the son of Ochran. From Gad, Eliasaph, the son of Duel. From Naphtali, Ahira, the son of Enan. These were the ones chosen from the congregation, the chiefs of their ancestral tribes, the heads of the clans of Israel. Moses and Aaron took these men who had been named, and on the first day of the second month, they assembled the whole congregation together, who registered themselves by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names from 20 years old and upward, head by head, as the Lord commanded Moses. So he listed them in the wilderness of Sinai. The people of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, their generations by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, head by head, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Reuben, were 46,500. And then over the next section, from verse 22 to verse 43, we have all the warriors listed and numbered from the other tribes, followed by the summary of this exercise, beginning at verse 44. These are those who were listed, whom Moses and Aaron listed, with the help of the chiefs of Israel, 12 men, each representing his father's house. So all those listed of the people of Israel by their fathers' houses, from 20 years old and upward, every man able to go to war in Israel, all those listed were 603,550. But the Levites, members of the tribe of Levi, were not listed along with them by their ancestral tribe. For the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not list, and you shall not take a census of them among the people of Israel. But appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings and they shall take care of it and shall camp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down and when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp and each man by his own standard. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus did the people of Israel, they did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses." The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The people of Israel shall camp, each by his own standard, with the banners of their fathers' houses. They shall camp 
facing the tent of meeting on every side. Those to camp on the east side toward the sunrise shall be of the standard of the camp of Judah by their companies, the chief of the people of Judah being Nashon, the son of Amminadab. His company is listed being 74,600. Those to camp next to him shall be the tribe of Issachar, the chief of the people of Issachar being Nethanel, the son of Zuar. His company is listed being 54,400. Then the tribe of Zebulun, the chief of the people of Zebulun being Eliab, the son of Helon. His company is listed being 57,400. All those listed of the camp of Judah by their companies, that's these three tribes together, were 186,400. They shall set out first on the march. And we then have an account of the arrangement of the other tribes as they were to camp at night. And finally, a summary section beginning at verse 32. These are the people of Israel as listed by their fathers' houses. All those listed in the camps by their companies were 603,550. But the Levites were not listed among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. Thus did the people of Israel. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so they camped by their standards, and so they set out, each one in his clan, according to his father's house. Amen. This is the word of the Lord, and may it be a blessing and an encouragement to us this evening. Well, let's turn to our hymn books again. <clears throat> It would help me if I had a hymn book. Martin, you wouldn't mind just passing me that? Thank you very much. It's 299, a lovely hymn by John Newton. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. Number 299.
Well, a lovely hymn there from John Newton, who lived through troubled times. I always think it's interesting to look at the dates of these hymn writers. There's John Newton, 1725 to 1807. Battle of Trafalgar, 1805. Napoleon, the great threat. All these sort of things were going on. The slavery question, Wilberforce, who was a friend of Newton's. Interesting to, to think of the, the historical background against which a man like this writes his hymns. It helps to bring home uh, the importance of what he's saying. Well, now we're going to have a little bit of a pause, as we usually do, some music. Our offering will be taken up for the Lord's work, and then we shall sing together, and then we shall pray and then sing again. <clears throat> let us bow our heads together again and pray. Pray to the Lord who loves us, knows us, loves to hear our cries. We read this in the Psalms, in Psalm 119. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much that we who live so much in the dark are able to be given light by the unfolding of your words, as though something precious is taken out of a, a drawer and is spread out before us, and we can see its shape and beauty, and our whole heart and life is enlightened by what we see. We thank you so much that your word under, uh, imparts understanding to the simple, and we freely confess our own simplicity. We long to know you better, dear Heavenly Father, and we turn to you again tonight asking that you will fill our hearts and minds afresh with light and truth and with the delights of your word. Indeed, we know, dear Father, that your words are not separate from you. They're indeed the very expression of your heart and mind. And as we open up the Bible in any part, we know that we're hearing from you, that you speak to us just as we speak to each other, expressing from our mouths the things that go on inside us. And we know that that's the way you do it for us as well. So please be our teacher again this evening. We pray too for our Iranian congregation downstairs as we hear them singing. And our prayer is that you will give them also light and joy, growing understanding, grace in the gospel. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn now to sing together hymn number 572. 572, Jesus, come, for we invite you. 572.
Well, let's turn again to our book of Numbers, chapter 1, on page 108 in our church Bibles. Organizing the people, that's our title for tonight, Organizing the People. Well, I hear are two Bible verses, <clears throat> A and B. Ask yourself, which is the more gripping? A. But Jael, the wife of Heba, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to Sisera and drove the peg into his temple until it went into the ground while he was lying asleep from weariness. And so he died. Judges 4, 21. B. Those listed of the tribe of Reuben were 46,500. Numbers 1, 21. Now, some parts of the Bible, at least on the surface, seem to be more interesting than others. And these opening verses of the book of Numbers don't seem to be too promising. But if the Apostle Paul was right when he said, all scripture is breathed out by God, then even the census returns of Numbers chapter 1 are divinely inspired. And if Jesus was right when he said, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished, then these opening salvos of the book of Numbers demand our careful attention. So let me say this just to encourage you as we begin. Numbers is first and foremost and most importantly about God, and God is always deeply interesting. And then secondly, Numbers is about God's people, those that he's called and chosen and commissioned. And the church today stands fundamentally in the same relationship to God as the people of Israel did in Old Testament times. So as we study the book of Numbers over these coming weeks, it will help us to understand better the relationship between God and his people. Now, if we're Christian people, if we're members of the church of Christ, the thing that defines our lives is our relationship to the one true God. We do have other relationships that are important, We relate to each other, we relate to other churches, we relate importantly to the non-Christian world, and of course to our families and friends and work colleagues. But our primary relationship is to God himself. Our God loves much, but he also expects much. And the book of Numbers will teach us both about his love and about his expectations. Now look with me at the very first verse of the book because it sums up for us the point in Old Testament history that Israel has reached. So verse 1, now we're thinking chronology here. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. So it's a year and a month, it's 13 months since the Israelites have crossed the Red Sea and have been liberated from their slavery in Egypt. And they are still in the wilderness of Sinai. Moses has been up the mountain, up Mount Sinai, to receive the law from God. And the point has now been reached when the people are ready to set out on their journey northwards to the promised land. So that very first verse of the book of Numbers locates us at Sinai. And don't turn this up now, but the very last verse of the book of Numbers locates the Israelites in the plains of Moab some 40 years later on the banks of the River Jordan, just about to cross over into Canaan. Now, it's only just over 200 miles from Sinai to the banks of the Jordan. A snail could get from Sinai to Canaan in less than 40 years, surely. So why did it take the Israelites so long 40 years to do 200 miles. Well, the painful delay was all due to Israel's disobedience. Their relationship to God was tried and tested and found wanting at many points on their long journey. But it's precisely those points of difficulty which will teach us and help us not to follow in the footsteps of our Israelite forefathers. So I want this evening to take these first two chapters of the book and to ask the question, what do these chapters teach us about our God, and we'll find that he's a God who is organizing his people to fulfill his great purposes. So let's notice four things. First, 
He is a God who knows and numbers his people. Numbers, numbers of people are important in the Bible. Counting people is important because each individual is important to God. There's no need to turn this up, but I want to read to you the opening sentence, the very first verse of the book of Exodus, because it also includes some numbers. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. And then Moses writes a verse or two later, the people of Israel were fruitful in Egypt and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. <laughs> we might say, yes, Moses' brother, you're not exaggerating. There were 70 that went down to Egypt, and then 400 years later, something like 2 million were rescued from Egypt. They certainly prospered numerically. So the people of Israel were counted. They were numbered when they went down to Egypt, and now they're being numbered again, having left Egypt. God is interested in precise numbers because he's interested in every one of his people. Now, the interest that he showed in his people then is the same as the interest he shows today, and it's very comforting. Think of it like this. You and I are sharing this little planet with over 7 billion people, and it's easy to think of yourself as just a tiny scrap of data in a thousand computer files. Who knows where your name and, uh, and data gets to these days? Lob, E, Mr, reference number CK 147543980. That's me? Maybe, maybe that's you. There was one occasion in the Gospels when Jesus had sent out 72 missionaries. And when they returned to him, they reported joyfully, even the demons are subject to us because of your name. But Jesus said to them, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. You must rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now that's what the Lord God does. He writes the names of each of his people in heaven. Jesus says in John's gospel, the good shepherd calls his own sheep by name. I know my own and my own know me. So God is interested both in numbers and in names. These dozens of Jewish names here in Numbers chapter 1 and 2, they can seem rather forbidding. They're so foreign to our tongues. Look, look again at chapter 1 verses, well the verse is really from 4 down to 16. These names are so difficult for us. It's much easier for you and me to say Tom, Dick, and Harry than to say Shalumiel, the son of Zuri Shaddai, or Elishama, the son of Amihud. But God has caused these very names to be written here in the Bible for a reason, and that is that he's honoring these people. I know that when I'm reading through Bible passages like these at home in, in my own Bible reading, I've realized over the years that I need to read these names out loud, lovingly, and without hurrying. I'm quite sure I mispronounce lots of them. A Hebrew speaker listening to me would wince if he heard me. But if God honors them, then surely we should honor them too. Now let's notice how the numbers and the names are arranged, because the whole thing is set out in a very orderly and purposeful way. The command to number the people is given to Moses in verse 2, because he is the prophet and the leader of the people. And the census, <coughs> as verse 3 implies, is not to be of everyone, only of the men aged 20 and more, those who are able to fight as soldiers, the warriors. And we'll return to that subject uh, in a few minutes' time. Then you'll see in verse 3 that Aaron, Moses' brother, is to assist Moses. But, verse 4, it's a huge job with all these numbers. And so 12 men, the leaders of each of the 12 tribes, <coughs> are to assist Moses and Aaron. And the Lord names those 12 men with those complicated names in verses 5 to 15. So the arrangement is that we have the senior leader of Israel assisted by his brother and assisted by the 12 tribe chiefs. Now just look at the speed at which they move. Verse 1, the Lord gives his command to Moses on the first day of the second month. And now look at verse 17. Moses and Aaron took these men who had been named, and on the first day of the second month, they assembled the whole congregation together who registered them. No delay. Immediate response. 
Moses is urgent in his desire to obey the Lord. His head doesn't even hit the pillow for one night before he obeys the order from heaven. The Lord's servant is ready to act at a moment's notice, and that surely is an example for us to be quick to obey. Now let's also notice the number 12, even though the actual word 12 doesn't appear here in the chapter. The census takes place tribe by tribe, and you'll see the first tribe mentioned is Reuben in verse 20, and the twelfth tribe is Naphtali in verse 42. And you'll have noticed from verse 47 that the tribe of Levi is not included. The Levites had a very special role, and we'll think about that next week. We'll shelve that till next week. But there are still 12 tribes, even without the Levites. Now, you'll see the reason for this in verses 32 and 34. And that is that Joseph, who was one of the sons of Jacob, subdivides into the two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, who were Joseph's two sons, therefore grandsons of Jacob. But they received a special blessing from Jacob at the very end of his life, and it was as though Jacob had adopted them as his own sons. Now, numbers in the Bible are never magical, but they can be symbolic. And the two most important numbers in the Bible are seven, which speaks of completion and perfection, as in the seven days of creation. Perhaps this is why the number of the beast in the book of Revelation is six, six, six. Lacking, 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 if you see what I mean. So seven speaks of completion and perfection. And 12 is the other very important number. And 12 indicates the full number of God's people. So the 12 tribes of Israel indicate the full extent of God's Old Testament people. And this is why Jesus appointed 12 men to be his apostles. They were to be the foundation of God's new covenant people. And this is why at the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation, the city of the new Jerusalem is revealed and comes down from heaven. And John the apostle, as he looks at it, sees that this new city, the great city, has 12 gates And each gate is inscribed with the name of one of the sons of Israel. And then he notices the foundations of the city walls. And on each foundation, there are 12 foundations, on each one is written the name of one of the 12 apostles of Jesus. So the symbolism is unmistakable. The new Jerusalem, the city of heaven, where all God's people live eternally with him, has within it all who belong to him from the old covenant period and all who belong to him from the new covenant era. Believers from before the time of Christ and believers since the coming of Christ, the full number of God's people, all saved, of course, by Christ because the effects of his wonderful death work retrospectively through history as well as prospectively. Our God then, to come back to Numbers chapter one, is a God who knows his people. He knows every one of them. He's interested in each one. These figures and these lists are very important to him. So how can we learn from this? If it's important for him to know his people like this, shouldn't it also be important for us to know his people as well as we possibly can? After all, knowing God's people is part of caring for God's people. Let me ask, <coughs> why, do we come, why do we come to the meetings of the church? Why do we come to a meeting like this? Well, we come to hear God's word, to hear it read and taught. We come to pray. We come to praise God, to sing the truth about him in our songs. We come to encourage each other, to encourage each other to keep going and to keep serving. And we come to share the happiness of belonging to the company of those who are redeemed and forgiven. The Lord's people are the Lord's family. And part of the business of belonging to the family is the importance of knowing each other. And not all families work very well. I think some families have an Uncle Hubert. His name may not be Hubert, but they have perhaps an uncle who's a miserable old grump. You can just about persuade him to come and visit you once a year if you offer him Christmas dinner. And when he comes, all he does is sit in a corner reading an Agatha Christie and speaking in monosyllables. So what Uncle Hubert needs to do is to engage properly with his nieces and his nephews and to ask them a few questions about themselves. Come on, Kirsty, what are you doing now? You're a nurse, are you? On an intensive care ward? Oh, must be demanding. Do you like the work? 
Now, an uncle who talks to his niece like that is an uncle who's taking membership of the family seriously. And what's your brother doing now, Kirsty? Milking cows near Cumbernauld? He must smell lovely after a day's work. Now, that's the way to be an uncle, isn't it? So let's be like that with the Lord's family as well. Asking questions is a very encouraging thing to do. Now, you're not being nosy, you're being supportive. Let me suggest a few questions that a loving church member can ask of other church members. How's that rotten old knee of yours, Fred? Is it any better? Fred, I guess, is getting on in years, isn't he? Now, to a younger person. Hello, are you new here? Have you come to Glasgow to study? Would you like to come home and have some lunch with us? Well, how about this? I can see you're African. Which country do you, do you come from the east of Africa or the west? Which is your home country? Or, I can see that you're Iranian. What's your name? Abdullah. Abd I'm going to write that on the back of my hand because I want to remember it when I see you next week. The Lord knows his people, every one of them. So let's be like him. Belonging to the church, to the Lord's family, it is the greatest privilege that a human being can possibly have. Now, I know that some of us are shyer than others. Some find it quite hard to take the initiative in starting and developing friendships, but it does get easier with practice. It is always worth the effort. So there's the first thing. The Lord knows his people. He counts his people. He knows everyone. He loves his people. Let's be like him. Now, second, the Lord prepares his people for warfare. Look again at chapter 1, verse 3. From 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war, you and Aaron shall list them company by company. And, and that point about those who are ready to go to war is made 12 times over because it comes in each paragraph of the tribe by tribe census. The first one is at the end of verse 20. Every male from 20 years old and upwards, all who were able to go to war. And that phrase is there in every paragraph down to verse 42. And it's there in the summary verse at the end, verse 45. Every man able to go to war in Israel, all those listed were 603,550. That is a very big army. It's about seven or eight times as big as the British army today. Now, it's very striking to have it put like this right at the beginning of the book of Numbers. This is not a typical great trek, like the great trek of the Boers or the, the Mormons to Salt Lake City. The primary characteristic of this great movement of people is military. And that naturally makes us feel a bit uncomfortable. We have a horror of warfare, partly because the 20th century was so deeply ravaged by horrible wars and we're all aware of the misery and suffering caused by conflicts uh, in the 21st century as different tribes and nations go to war with each other and shout at each other. And the Bible itself, in the prophet Isaiah chapter 2, holds out to us a vision of swords being beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more, says the Lord himself through the prophet Isaiah. So if the Lord's vision of the great future is of a war-free earth, why is he so insistent in Numbers chapter 1 on counting and measuring Israel's military muscle? Well, the answer is that war has to be waged before peace can be finally established. The goal of the Israelites was the peace and rest of the promised land. You get a partial glimpse of that peace and rest during the reign of Solomon. Let me read you a famous verse from 1 Kings chapter 4. And Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan even to Beersheba. That's like from John O'Groats to Land's End, from the top to the bottom. They lived in safety, every man under his vine and under his fig tree all the days of Solomon. Now that's the great goal, peace, rest, and plenty. The final kingdom of the Lord will have nothing in it that harms or hurts. But for peace to be established, war first has to be waged and won. Now, the underlying warfare throughout the Bible is the warfare between the Lord and Satan. Remember how the Lord says to Satan in Genesis chapter 3, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. 
Notice those words, I will put enmity. It's the Lord who causes the warfare, who wages war. And he causes the spiritual warfare because only by waging the war and winning the war can peace be established. And we see different phases of this holy warfare in different parts of the Bible story. These military men of Israel in Numbers chapter 1 have to be able to fight because various kings and nations are going to oppose them and stand in their way before they can reach Canaan, the promised land. And when they do finally reach the promised land, they're going to have to fight on. They're going to have to fight the indigenous Canaanites in order to expel them from the promised land. And their expulsion of those Canaanite nations will be righteous and God-ordained because the Israelites will be the instruments of God's righteous judgment against the Canaanites. It's not just an exercise in land grabbing or ethnic cleansing. The Old Testament is absolutely clear that the Canaanites are ripe for God's judgment because of their abominable cultural practices, child sacrifice and so on. But the warfare has to be waged before the peaceful settlement can be enjoyed. Now the military era of God's people as physically armed warriors, that era was of course temporary and limited in scope. Christian people today, we're not armed with sword and spear and Kalashnikov, not at all. But the New Testament teaches us that we are to be the Lord's fighting force in a different way. Just think of the arrival of Jesus. He came as the Prince of Peace, but he could only establish peace in a real and eternal sense for his people by waging war against the devil and by winning that war. As John the Apostle puts it in his first letter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared, isn't that a good way to start a verse? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So the creator becomes the destroyer. He has to. Otherwise, there can be no eternal peace for his people. The cross was the place where Jesus decisively defeated the devil. The Prince of Peace, therefore, is a warrior. And thank God that he is the invincible warrior. In the song of Moses and Miriam, in Exodus chapter 15, just after they've crossed the Red Sea, there is this line, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Isn't that a striking phrase? The Lord is a man of war. So friends, let's never be embarrassed at the idea that the Lord's people are a fighting force. Our weapons are not swords and guns, but the gospel, the powerful arguments and reasoning of the gospel. I think of it, if you're a Christian, when you became a Christian, what happened? You listened, you heard the gospel, and as you heard it, you were persuaded by it to abandon the devil's lies and to embrace the truth about God. And as our life as Christians develops, we see more and more clearly how empty and pathetic are the lies of the devil, the values of the godless world, the things that our friends who are not Christians live for. What are they? They're will-o'-the-wisps, they're nothings, vanity and lies. So let me ask, are you willing to think of yourself as a soldier in Christ's army? Are we willing, as a church, to think of ourselves as a unit in the great battalion under our commander-in-chief? Let's not be squeamish about it. We are engaged in the great warfare. I remember when I first went off to a scripture union camp as a teenager, the camp leader was called the commandant, and he asked us boys to call him, to address him as commie. His right-hand man was called the adjutant. We had to call him Aji. And the leaders were called officers. Christian youth organizations, going back a, a generation or two, they often wore uniform and had titles like campaigners and crusaders and church lads brigade. Now, we've moved very much away from that overtly military style these days, and there are perhaps good reasons for changing the trimmings. But we mustn't lose the underlying reality. The Lord Jesus is our commander. He has dealt the devil a fatal wound, and the final victory is secured. But in the meantime, the fatally wounded serpent is still filling the world with his lies, and our task is to oppose them with the truth of the gospel. We do it graciously, we do it lovingly, but we must do it firmly and prayerfully. 
Now, thirdly, and this is a great comfort to the Lord's soldiers, Numbers chapter 2 shows us that the Lord journeys with his people as they set out towards the promised land and engage in warfare. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying... Now, chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord speaks to Moses, but here in chapter 2, things are centered on the positioning of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, which is Aaron's responsibility because he's the high priest. And chapter 2 sets out in words how the camp of Israel is to be physically arranged. Chapter 2 describes the campsite. And it's very different from going to a campsite at Pitlochry for the weekend with 20 or 30 tents spread out higgledy-piggledy across a field. We have here an enormous number of people, over 600,000 fighting men. And then there are all the women and children and teenagers as well. Verse 2 gives the basic instruction. The people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard, that's his flag, with the banners of their father's houses. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. So the tabernacle, that's the portable tent looked after by the Levites, the tabernacle is to be pitched in the very center of the campsite. And just try and imagine that. It's a huge campsite with all these people. But stand with me, stand beside me, if you will, in your imagination, beside the tabernacle, right in the middle, which represents the very presence of God. Can you picture the vastness of the wilderness of Sinai stretching out on all sides? Can you smell the smell of the dust? Can you hear the Middle Eastern ravens croaking overhead? Can you hear the elderly people coughing in their tents? <coughs> now, look eastwards, verse 3. Encamped on the eastward side are the three tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Then turn to the south in verse 10. And there you see Reuben and Simeon and Gad. Then look west in verse 18. And you see the tents of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And then turn northwards in verse 25, and you see the tribes of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. But those hundreds of thousands of tents are not just pitched haphazardly, facing every which way. Look back to verse 2. Every tent is to be pitched with its front flaps facing the tabernacle. So when little Johnny Naphtali, age 7, gets up in the morning and steps outside the tent, his mother calls to him from inside, what's the weather like, Johnny? Warm, he says, as usual. And what can you see, Johnny? I see a tent, mother. It's a beautiful tent. And what does that tent mean, Johnny? It means, mother, that the Lord is in the midst of our camp. That's my boy. Now go and wash your face. You see, she's teaching him there to know the Lord. Verse 2, they shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. It's a powerful visual aid. The Lord is setting it out like this so that the people are being constantly reminded that he is there with them in their midst. And verse 17, really, I didn't read it out earlier, but verse 17 is the centerpiece of the whole chapter. Then the tent of meeting shall set out with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camps. As they camp, so shall they set out, each in position, standard by standard. In other words, whether the people are moving and marching or camping and resting, the presence of the Lord is, is visually tangible in their midst. Now, we, the Church of Christ today, we need no physical tent to look at. We're in a far better position than the ancient Israelites. John the Evangelist, at the beginning of his gospel, writes this, The Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Jesus is the tabernacle who has superseded the Old Testament tabernacle, the tabernacle which eventually became the temple. He is the new temple. He has come into our midst. And although his physical human body has been withdrawn from our sight, he dwells with us in the person of his Holy Spirit, his other self, and we ourselves, the church of Christ, become the temple. As Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also, you Ephesians, are being built together 
into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we who are the church of Christ, we are now the dwelling place of God. The tabernacle in Numbers chapter 2 represented the dwelling of God with his people. But now, since the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, every Christian is the dwelling place of God, and every congregation of Christ's people is his residence. The Lord was with the Israelites as they marched and as they went to war, and when they camped and rested and slept, he was with them. And he's with us as we serve him and proclaim the good news about him and bring our lives under his wholesome and kindly discipline. So far then, the God of Numbers 1 and 2 is a God who knows and numbers his people, a God who prepares his people for warfare, and a God who journeys with his people on the march. And lastly, fourthly, he is a God who expects his people's obedience. Just look at the last verse of chapter 1, 154. Thus did the people of Israel. They did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. Then look at chapter 2, verse 33. But the Levites were not listed among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. And verse 34, thus did the people of Israel according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they camped by their standards, etc. As the Lord commanded Moses. Moses. That's one of the great refrains of the first five books of the Bible. Now Moses, you know, is the human author of these five books, but he doesn't write these phrases about his own obedience to the Lord. He doesn't write those in order to enhance his legacy. He's not like a modern prime minister or president who's concerned to be well thought of in the future. He's not saying, haven't I done well? I've done everything that the Lord commanded me to do. No, his concern is not with his reputation. What he's concerned about is that the people should learn that obedience is God's concern. So whenever Moses writes a phrase like that, he's wanting to be provocative. He's wanting his readers to pause and to think, ah yes, to do as God commands is at the very heart of being a faithful member of the people of God. Think of the central message of Moses' final sermons in the book of Deuteronomy. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings disaster. Therefore, obey the Lord, O Israel. To obey is life and blessing. Just look again at the first sentence of chapter 2, verse 34. Thus did the people of Israel. And look at the phrase immediately before it. As the Lord commanded Israel. And then look, look at the phrase immediately afterwards according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. What a blessing that the people of Israel were obedient at that point. Now, alas, there was plenty of disobedience to follow. But at this point, as they set out from Sinai, they were doing as the Lord commanded Moses. Obedience, it's always the way of safety and joy, whereas disobedience in the end can only bring downfall and ruin what marks these opening chapters of Numbers is a sense of discipline and good order and purpose. The warriors are counted, the camp is arranged, the Lord is traveling in their midst, and the people are obedient. It's a very attractive picture, and it has a lot to say to the Church of Christ. Think of our world today, because today we live in a society which is marked by quite the opposite qualities. Lives of disorder are all around us. Many people feel that moral anarchy and a life driven only by king self is the way to live a happy and useful life. But we weren't made for anarchy. We need God as our king and Jesus as our commanding officer. We need the fellowship of the church and we need the rich teaching of the Bible. We need the sense of purpose that comes from being soldiers of the warrior king, the king whose gospel defeats the lies and deceitfulness of our enemy. If we are Christian people, the church of Christ, the Lord is in our midst, his weapon is in our hand, and our destination is the glorious kingdom beyond this world where Christ reigns. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. <clears throat> Lord, 
Dear God, our Father, we thank you for raising up Moses to lead your people and for teaching him how to record these momentous and foundational events in the first five books of the Bible. We thank you for this Torah, this basic and wonderful instruction that you give to us. And we pray that you'll fill our hearts with an increasing hunger for it, that we should live our life this way, in the way that Moses teaches, and discover the joy and life and blessing of your kind care. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our final hymn is a hymn for a battling church. Let's turn to number 854, 854 in our hymn books. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Who will be his helpers other lives to bring? Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? Number 854. Some words of the Apostle Paul as we close. 
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.